Good morning. It is great to be in worship with you all this morning. Uh, we welcome you if you are uh, been with us for a long time. We're glad you're here and please encourage you to fill out the, the pew pads and pass those on down the aisle so everybody can uh, get a record of their attendance here. Also, if you are a guest with us, maybe first or second time, haven't filled out one of these uh, connect cards, we encourage you to fill out one of these front and back and uh, place it in one of the offering plates at the front or the rear of the sanctuary. We'd love to get to know you a little more. A few other announcements to draw your attention to. We have one more Sunday to go search for some spare change around your house. I remember when I was a kid, my, my stepmom would ask me to clean out her car, and the deal was I could keep any, of the, any bit of the change I found in her car, and there's always tons of change. So if your car is anything like my stepmom's car in the late 90s, early 2000s, you might be able to fill out one of these uh, bottles. Also, a special announcement right now from Ms. Tina for VBS. School is this week, so we would appreciate your prayers. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, and also, if you are finding yourself needing something to do between the hours of 9 and 12, we would love for you to come and see what the kids are doing. Um, we always have a spot for you. The more helpers, the merrier. Thank you. And lastly, but certainly not least, I'd like to uh, give special thanks to Dr. Tyler Plaxico here to my right. He is the president and CEO of Wesley Glenn Ministries, and he'll be uh, sharing the word with us this morning. So we're thankful for you here with us, Dr. Plaxico. And now let us join together as we pray the collect of purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. As you can see, Ashley's not with us this morning, but he recorded the music for us last week, so we still have him with us today. Would you please stand with us now as we sing our hymn of praise? Come, Christians, join to sing. Please remain standing and join with me as we profess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven 
and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we join together in prayer, please um, pay, pay attention to those uh, prayer concerns in the bulletin uh, today and throughout the week. Let us go to God in prayer. Good morning, Father. We thank you for another day to rise up and worship you. We thank you for these four walls that you've provided for us to gather. We thank you for this fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ gathered here. We thank you for your amazing grace that makes us whole. May each of us freely accept your grace and be a witness of transformation to our neighbors. We thank you for how you're working in the ministries of this church. We especially lift up to you our VBS leaders and Ms. Tina as they prepare to minister to our children this week. May your spirit move in a mighty way. Father, now we ask you to draw us near to you in the worship we share. May the meditation of our hearts, your words spoken, and the praises we sing together be to glorify you. And now we pray as your son Jesus taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we'd like to invite our children to come down for some time with Miss Tina. It's too quiet. How are you guys doing? Good? Hello. So, I have a question. Have any of you ever made a promise? Have you kept the promise? <laughs> At least you're honest. Now, I have a question. If you made a promise and nobody was watching, and it was, hmm, mom said, promise me you won't eat your dessert at lunch before you eat your sandwich. Would she know about it? Would you still keep the promise? <laughs> if they weren't in this room right now, would you still be keeping the promise? Okay, good. This is kind of what we want to talk about today, is keeping promises even if nobody is looking. It's a good thing. You ever hear of a pinky promise? That's the ultimate promise. If you pinky promise, you better be keeping that promise forever and ever. And we're going to talk about some of God's promises that he's given us um, in children's church. Parents, we're all going to be in one room today on, on the breezeway. So that's where you'll pick up your kids. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your promises. Thank you for keeping them, even though you don't have to. Thank you for keeping them and loving us and help us to be like you to keep our promises even when nobody is looking. In your precious name, amen. All right, let's go. I want to continue for your continued promises of giving generously to this church and to help all the ministries that in and outside the walls of this church. I want to remind you that we have offering plates at the front and the rear, and you can also securely give online. We thank you. The best of me is barely breathing when I'm not somebody I believe in. Hold on to me when I miss the light the night have stolen. 
When I'm slamming all the doors you've opened, hold on to me. Hold on to me. Hold on to me when it's too dark to see you. When I am sure I have reached the end. Hold on to me when I forget I need you. When I let go, hold me again. When I don't feel like I'm worth defending. When I'm tired of my pretending. Hold on to me. When I start to break in desperation. Underneath the weight of expectation hold on to me hold on to me hold on to me when it's too dark to see you when i am sure i have reached the end hold on to me when I forget I need you when I let go hold me again I can rest here in your arms forever cause I know nobody loves me better hold on to me Amen. Will you please stand with me now for the reading of God's word. From 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. David asks, Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I, shall, to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel in Lodeber. So King David had him brought to Lodeber from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore you to, the, to all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant? that you should notice a dead dog like me. Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops, so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my, at my table. Then Mephibosheth said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at, the king, at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. 
Oh, we can do better than that. Y'all sound like a bunch of Methodists. Good morning. It is good to be with you. As Jeremy said, I'm Tyler Plaxico. I am not Roy White. Roy has more hair than me, but he invited me to come and speak, and I appreciate it so much. You have a beautiful church and a wonderful community, but welcome to worship in this wonderful house, and welcome to all those who are worshiping with us online. Thank you so much for being with us today. What a great crowd. Usually when you uh, have a substitute teacher and the mouse is away, sometimes or the cat's away, sometimes the, uh, the mice go to play, but I appreciate you being here with me today. Uh, as I come to speak about the ministry that I'm a part of, uh, I, I am uh, uh, here today to speak to you on behalf of that ministry, and it's Wesley Glenn Ministries, uh, and I'm blessed to be the president and CEO. Started a couple of years ago and began my third year just this month, and before that, I was a pastor in the local churches, served uh, as a senior pastor of congregations throughout South Georgia, and grew up in Macon myself. But Funny enough, my my connection to St. Mary's goes all the way back to my Boy Scout days when I was a Boy Scout in Troop 19. Uh, Me and my dad and the rest of the Scouts came down here and we toured the sub base when I was about 12 years old. So that was a, a little while ago. And then we, we took a trip over to Cumberland Island and we, uh, we, we camped out there. I've been so told that you can't even go and tour the subs anymore, but uh, we did there and it was a great experience. I tell you, that was a highlight of my trip here. I drove down from Macon uh, yesterday afternoon and time to walk along the waterfront. I heard y'all had a fishing tournament and some reds were caught and kingfish and we had some music played and it was great. I got to eat at, at uh, Seagulls yesterday and that was great, wonderful experience. Uh, your town is gorgeous, it is beautiful. Uh, and I get to come down here at least once a year uh, because we have one of our homes. One of uh, Wesley Glenn's group homes is right around the corner. Uh, we serve here uh, four ladies and uh, from what I understand, uh, they, they come to church from time to time. So thank you for being good hosts to them. But I appreciate the invitation to be here, I truly do. You heard a difficult passage that Jeremy had to lift up. Names like Mephibosheth, Lodabar, and Zeba are not all easy to say. We can't all be Peter and John, Mark, and Paul. So uh, we stumble over some of the uh, Old Testament names. But it is a text that I, that I lift up very purposefully to you. Because for me, it really tells the story of radical kindness, which really is the mission and call of the ministry that we have at Wesley Glen. But you heard that text lifted up, and it's a great story, one from 2 Samuel, that you really don't hear lifted up that often, though it is a great and wonderful story in and of itself, in a book that is full of wonderful stories. And so I lift that up to tell you the story of Wesley Glenn today. But as I've often said in any church I've ever served, in almost every sermon I've ever preached, If you're really going to understand Scripture in the way that God really seeks to have you understand it, you have to fully understand the context that surrounds that word. And what do I mean by that? You really have to understand what is going on at the time of that story. And so to to kind of jump into where we are, the word that you heard Jeremy lift up, we got to understand what's going on at that time. Okay, so we all know King David, right? The ruddy shepherd boy who was called from obscurity to, uh, to become the king of all Israel. Well, oftentimes we forget that David was not the first king, right? He was not the first king of Israel. Who was that first king? Do we know? Saul, that's exactly right. King Saul was the first king of united Israel. And how did we get to, to Saul? Remember? People do as people do so oftentimes, and when they want what somebody else has, they often say, give us what they have, because we want to be just like them. And so that's exactly what the people of Israel did. It wasn't enough that God was leading them in a very personal way. They said to God, give us a king like everybody else. Give us a king that will rule over us like all the other nations. And that Chinese proverb comes to mind, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. Well, that was King Saul. King Saul at first was a wonderful leader, godly man in and of his own right, head and shoulders above the all. You know, what you want in a leader, a strong man who was capable of all things, a military leader, someone who stayed close to God and followed godly example. But then Saul did as people often do. In times, uh, he drifted from the Lord. I know none of you have done this, but he drifted from God. And he got further and further and further away. 
And then God began to pull his presence from Saul's life. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Closeness to God and then feeling God's very presence being pulled away. And then he was tormented, remember, by the evil spirits. And he had this horrible interactions throughout his life as he began to drift further and further away from God. And he began to do things in his own way and not according to God's example and what God would wish of him. And in the midst of all of that, you have the coming of David. So the prophet goes to seek out the next king and he goes to, to the village and the part of the Israel where David lives and he goes to David's father. You remember that wonderful story? And he lines up the brothers, you know, he has the young oldest brothers all the way down to the, to the youngest brothers. And the prophet says, no, not that one. No, not that one. Not, not that one. He goes all the way through the brothers. And, and finally, the, the father is, well, who, who is it that you would want? Is there anyone left? The prophet says, well, there's David. You know, but he's my youngest. He's out as a shepherd in the fields. And he says, that's the one. That's the one I want. That's the one that God has called to be the next king. And then, of course, we know the story of David. David does the incredible things afterwards. As a young boy, what does David do next that makes him so famous? We tell the story in VBS all the time. What does David do? He's, he, he slays Goliath. We, we know that story, but you know that story very, very well. He slays Goliath and that kind of gets his, his PR out there and he begins to, to become very well known amongst the people of Israel. I mean, how could you not be well known after a story like that in front of all the people? Well, his stock begins to rise and God begins to pour on his power into David's life and he begins to grow into a great and godly man himself. But you know what happens in certain circumstances like that? where you have a leader who is descending and one who is rising, there's often this conflict between the two. And Saul did not like or take to the fact that David was going to take over his job, his role as king. And so that, that green-eyed demon of envy began to creep into Saul's life. And rather than stepping aside and allowing David to take on his anointed responsibility as king, what does Saul do? He does quite the opposite, doesn't it? He, he seeks to have David killed and he chases him in these wonderful stories zigzagging all the way across Israel. David has to live in caves and he becomes a, a bandit leader in a foreign land. And he has all these opportunities where he could have taken Saul's life and ended all this chaos in his own life. But he chooses not to because he's such a godly man. But then in the midst of all of this, David forms this very unlikely friendship with this young man whose name was Jonathan. Remember, Jonathan is the, the son of King Saul. Now, of course, you would think that David would not gravitate towards the family member of the, the man who seeks to kill him, but they become very close. A very close friendship forms, and they fight in wars together, they battle together, they, they do wonderful things in the name of the Lord together, but the writing on the wall begins to appear and Jonathan begins to see that David is most likely going to be the very next king of Israel and he's going to defeat his father. And so Jonathan goes to David and he says, David, if there is a friendship amongst us, if you love me as a brother, would you just please, would you please fulfill just one promise to me? Would you care for the descendants of my family? Would you not harm those of my house which of course back then it was the custom for all the remaining heirs of a former king to be killed so that no one would threaten the reign of the new king so that was a big promise to make but of course David the godly man that he was makes that promise to Jonathan and then sadly not too long afterwards Jonathan and Saul were both killed in battle David becomes king and he reigns over a unified Israel. And he has this opportunity to sit upon the throne in Jerusalem, to prop up his feet and to gloat in the successes that he's had. But the very first thing that he does as king over all of Israel, as he seeks to fulfill that promise to his dead friend Jonathan, and he asks that question, is there anyone left? Is there anyone left from this family? Anyone left from the family of Jonathan and Saul that I might show kindness to. Ziba comes to him and says, well, well, there's Mephibosheth, but, you know, 
You don't need to worry about Mephibosheth. He's lame in both legs. He's long gone. Sad story, really, of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, the good friend of David. And he was raised in the palace of Jerusalem. Had all the proper things that you could have wanted. Truly had the silver spoon in his mouth as a child. But then as things began to change and the regimes began to flip, and it began to be seen that David was going to take power, there was a, a wet nurse, a, a, a housemaid, who, who saw that the, the armies of David were descending upon Jerusalem. And she gathered up Mephibosheth, who was five years old at the time. And in that palace of Jerusalem, she taught to, to hurry him out so that the soldiers would not kill him. But in her haste, as she ran, she dropped this little boy. And his legs were broken badly. And he was crippled and lame in both feet. And there was no orthopedics in that time, and so he was badly malformed. And his story doesn't end there. It seems to get worse. Mephibosheth is taken from a palace in Jerusalem all the way off to Lodabar. Now, Lodabar is the community where your mama told you not to go. It's on the other side of the other side of the bad side of the railroad tracks. Definitely the place that you didn't go after dark. Lodabar was the place where outcasts went, where lepers would go to live, where no one would want to go, but where you were sent when you had nowhere else to go. It was a barren place, far from Jerusalem, where nothing grew and no one wanted to be. And that's where Mephibosheth grew. His crippled legs by himself, he sought to scrape a living as best he could. And that's where David calls him from, from Lodabar. And I often think what that must have been like. You are the last living descendant of the former king. Knowing what, what the tradition was that your life was forfeit when the new king came to power. So the new king David calls Mephibosheth from Lodabar all the way back to Jerusalem to appear before him in the throne room itself. And I often think of what that must have been like as that young man hobbled his way down the center aisle to stand in front of King David himself, knowing that this was most likely the way his life would end, that he would be killed right then and there, simply for having been the son of the son of the former king. So he bows down before King David and he says, what is it that a dead dog like me would take notice of a king like you. Can you imagine thinking of yourself in those terms? But what does David do? He shows the godly heart for which God knew was in him to begin with. He asks him to rise and he restores to him all that was taken away. He gives him back so much that was his before. And he treats him like one of his own sons. But then he has this wonderful catch of phrase where he says he welcomes him to the king's own table. He makes room for him at the table of the king. What an incredible story. A story of radical kindness. Mark Twain once said that kindness is a language that the mute can speak, the deaf can hear, and the blind can see. This is a story of kindness. And it's how kindness can transform a life. We see what it does for Mephibosheth. And that's exactly what we seek to do at Wesley Glen. Wesley Glen, as you may know, is, the, is a ministry agency of the South Georgia Annual Conference, a part of the United Methodist Church, where we see our mission as taking the Mephibosheths of the world from Lodabar to make room at our table. Adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, we invite to come and to be part of our community. People who have Down syndrome or who have autism or mild mental retardation, Rett syndrome, whatever it may be. We welcome them into community. We make room for them at our table and do our very best to treat them as princesses and princes of the Most High God. That is the mission of Wesley Glenn. We have our main campus in Macon, Georgia, where we have seven homes. We have our day program there where, where our residents get to come 
and learn how to do things that we so oftentimes take for granted in life. They learn how to tie their shoes, how to do arts and crafts, how to navigate technology, how to cook and clean and do things that they never thought that they could do before. We say at Wesley Glen that miracles happen there every day, and they truly do. We get to see the mute speak. We get to see the lame walk. We get to see people blossom and come out of their shells in amazing ways. It's amazing. It truly is. We take those Mephibosheths from Lodabar and we seek to treat them as best we can. Reminds me of a story. In my first week as CEO some years ago now at Wesley Glen, I was talking to the mother of one of our residents. And I just happened to ask, as I often do, and, and I said, what does Wesley Glen mean to you? This mother of one of our residents, she, she stopped and she says, Dr. T, they all call me Dr. T. Then, and she says, let me tell you what Wesley Glen means to not just me, but to mothers like me. She said, not too long ago, in the South especially, when you had a relative who had an intellectual or developmental disability, what you would do is you would take that relative and you would stick them in the farthest back bedroom of the house, in the darkness. That loved one with autism or Down syndrome, through no fault of their own, and you would hide them away so that the guests that would come to visit would not see the family shame. They would not see the family shame. She says, what you have done for my son and for others like him is that you have given him community. You have let him know he has value and worth, and you have shown him that in how you love. We've taken him from the load of bars of the world and made room at our table. We will and always believe to be that is the mission of Wesley Glenn. We provide 24-hour-a-day care to those just like Mephibosheth. We provide for their spiritual needs, their physical needs, their medical needs, anything in the world that you can possibly think your loved one might need, a grandson or a child, we provide to them. But I tell you this honestly, we could not do it were it not for churches like St. Mary's. St. Mary's is a strong supporter of Wesley Glen and always has been. You have been so good to the ladies that live in our home just around the corner. The St. Mary's Foundation has been so generous to us. You enable us to do what we do. And I don't say that lightly. And so I say this to you. On behalf of those we serve, thank you. Thank you for the support that you've had for a ministry now that is going into its fourth decade and people who have been on our campus and in our supports for well over 20 years, some who have been there for less than a year. COVID was difficult on us as it has been on y'all. We were under a shelter in place order for over a year and you supported us through it by your prayers and your generosity. You helped us through it all. And by God's grace, we did not have a single one of our residents test positive for COVID. Not one. We could not have done it without you and without your prayers and support. And for that, I'll always say thank you. I am deeply grateful for all that you have done. We appreciate your support. So many times people ask me, well, what can we do for Wesley Glenn? The first thing I always tell them to do is pray for us. Honestly, and I mean it. Not a flippant prayer where you say it and you move on. I mean, pray for us. Add Wesley Glenn, the residents, the participants, and the staff to your daily prayer list. Add them to the prayer list of your church and pray for us daily. But we'll take all the prayer that we can get. The other I say is partner with us. If you have the opportunity to join in ministry with us, do it. As I've said before, our group home is five miles away. You have every opportunity to wrap your arms around Mephibosheths at any opportunity you'd like. Wonderful ladies live just around the corner from you. And those sweet ladies love you as much as you love them. Partner with us. Join us in ministry. We'd love to have you love on those we love. 
And finally, I often say, if you can, if it's within your means, give. Give to us as best and possibly you can. Put a check in the mail. It helps us in every way provide meal and clothing and support for those that God has graced us with. And you've done that so well over the years. And so I honestly say thank you. Thank you on behalf of Wesley Glenn and the dozens and dozens of people that we serve, sweet souls that bless me every day and are a blessing in ways beyond measure. You have enabled the Mephibosheths of the world to come from Lodabar as we have made room at not just my table, for that table is yours as well. And so I say thank you. Thank you for helping us treat them like princesses and princes. For after all, aren't we all equal in the eyes of God, fearfully and wonderfully made, stitched together by loving hands in our mother's womb? We are all seen as equals to our loving Savior. Let us all see one another's as equal as well. Bless those in your life who happen to be different than you. Seek to make them feel whole and loved and valued by simply taking the time to make room at your table. Let us pray. Lord God, as we bow our heads, we thank you, God, for the wonderful church that is St. Mary's United Methodist Church. We thank you so much for the support that it has given to Wesley Glenn and to this wonderful community for so many years, for wonderful people who have come through the doors. God, we pray your blessings on each and every one of them. Whatever need is upon their hearts today, God, I ask that you meet it. Whatever blessing that they are seeking, God, we ask that you give it. We thank you for the sweet souls who sit in this place today, and we pray a mighty blessing to be upon each and every one of them. As they go forth today, let them be blessed in the upcoming days and weeks to come. Let them have a wonderful year as we come out of a very, very difficult one. Bless us, O Lord, with your protection and provision. Be with us as we come and go. For this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Fuxega, for that wonderful message. If you will please stand with me now as we sing our hymn of invitation, I love to tell the story, page 156 in your hymnals, and the words are also on the screen.
so much the invitation. I was meeting with Derek McAleer not too long ago, and he sends his love for Megan. He misses you, and he appreciated his time so much with you. I didn't want to fail to mention that to you before I go, because I know Derek would get on to me if I didn't. He sends his love. He's a sweet soul. He was at one of our events not too long ago. But as I've said, thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for thinking of us. Thank you for praying for us. You really have sustained us for a tough year. And I talked to Jerry, and I know how hard it's been in the, the life of the church. But it is so good to be back in God's house again. Let us never take it for granted how wonderful it is just to be amongst the saints again. To sing the hymns, to hear the word. Let us never forget what a privilege it is to share the elbow room with God's people. Would you receive this blessing in the name of the Lord? God, as we go forth today, we go forth in your love, mercy, and in grace. May you fill us up by your spirit. May us be well known to those who see us by our love. That they recognize in us the image of your son, Jesus Christ. That they may know what it means to love and be loved. Help us to be vessels of mercy and grace. That those who see us may know what it means to be Christian by our actions and all we do and say. Let us be living witnesses to the love and mercy of our Savior as we go forth as ambassadors of our faith. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.